So again, thank you all for coming out. I know it's a Friday, you know, post Dean's hour, had a lot of food in your stomach. So thanks for spending the time here today, and I'm looking forward to talking to you. So my name is Murphy Danahay, uh, and I'm going to be presenting today on the future of strategic leadership in a complex world. So let's get right into it. The Army is in a crisis. Now, this isn't a crisis that you can necessarily see. This isn't a crisis that's been accepted by everyone within the Army. Um, but I believe it exists, and let me tell you why. So Iraq and Afghanistan. We failed to live up to our full potential in Iraq and Afghanistan. We failed to achieve the strategic objectives that we did have. And even more importantly, we really failed to define strategic objectives uh, in a potent and powerful way. We haven't decisively won a war since World War II. Now, I know some people might argue with this, um, but if you really look at it, the army of the past was a decisive fighting force that would close with and destroy the enemy. It achieved its strategic objectives. The army of today has, if not failed to do so, at least failed to live up to its full potential. We've had difficulties with counterinsurgency. Counterinsurgency has been around for years. And our own doctrine, even, in counterinsurgency, we've really failed to live up to the full potential of that doctrine. We failed to adapt to changing warfare. Um, and we've seen that again and again in Iraq and Afghanistan. We have a hyperinflated budget. I'm aware of sequestration. I know we're cutting funds. But at the same time, we still have so much money, and yet it's le yielding t uh, limited tangible results. We keep spending it on the same things, and we fail to innovate. Slow integration of cyber. This is by our own admission. Uh, we've really failed to integrate cyber. We're probably not the number one cyber nation uh, in the world right now. And that is a huge failure, if you think about it, because that's the future of warfare right there. Crimean annexation, intentions with Russia. Russia was able to basically uh, exert their will as a geopolitical force, and we were able to do nothing. Uh, now, obviously, that was had some political reasons, but the Army was unable to provide a tailored solution so that we could do something. And I believe that that is a symptom of the United States people not trusting us and not trusting our ability to innovate and solve problems in this current landscape. And of course, again, by the Army's own admission, we have manpower issues, talent bleed. We are losing our best officers every single year. And they're going places like Fortune 500 companies. They're going to organizations that value their skills. Uh, and this, again, has been admitted by the Army. And of course, the rise of ISIS. We, uh, that, that's ongoing, and I don't think I need to say anything about that. Uh, and the Army has deployed solutions, but again, we've failed to provide the sort of solutions where we can see decisive victory. And this is a new phenomenon. If this was just something that had been happening for the entirety of the Army's history, I wouldn't be up here today. I wouldn't be saying anything. But this is a new phenomenon. This is something that we haven't seen in the past. Because if you look at the past, World War I and World War II, we were experiencing decisive victory. We were the most powerful military in the world by far. And I mean, we still are. But we were achieving strategic objectives everywhere you looked. Uh, our victory was something that you couldn't deny. But in the modern era, we're looking at defeat and more importantly, a lack of defined goals. The army of today is floundering. We're failing to meet up to our full potential. And why is that? I believe that we've seen a paradigm shift post-World War II that's gone unrecognized by our military and strategic leaders. And because of that, because of our fail to recognize it, we failed to adapt. And that is the real sin uh, in this current landscape. So what is it? What's changed? Because what we really have to do at this point is frame the problem. We have to describe the problem if we ever want to solve it. So tactics have stayed the same. That's, you know, door kickers on the ground. Our, our tactics look very similar. We haven't changed a whole lot. We have new technology, but we're doing the same thing there. But what has changed and what's changed profoundly is strategy. That is, you know, the Army's big, large-scale goals. That's how the Army operates, the ideas behind it. Strategy has changed fundamentally. And specifically, strategic complexity has changed. We're dealing with a fundamentally different strategic landscape, and we failed to recognize it. We failed to do anything about it. We failed to even say it happened. Now, why do I say that? Well, right here, you can see some characteristics of strategy in previous eras compared to today. And you'll notice there's pretty significant differences. In the previous era, you're de dealing with maneuver units, coordination of those units, 
logistics and support, but all these things, they rely on the same principles. They're the same sort of tasks, and they're the same sort of tasks from an off, the beginning of an officer's career uh, to the end. But in the modern era, strategy is just so fundamentally different. We're looking at things like economic warfare, cyber operations, information operations, nation building, peacekeeping, and of course, the ubiquitous cyber. Uh, so this is just a fundamentally different type of strategy that we're looking at, but we're treating it as the same old thing. And even more importantly, and perhaps something that's even harder to pick out, is in the past, uh, excuse me, tactics and strategy were very, very similar. They were practically you know, extensions of each other because as an officer moved from the beginning of their career working in tactics to working in strategy, they were basically just dealing with increases in the size of units. So they were leading larger and larger organizations, but the principles remained the same. And that actually did really great things for our army in the past. But in the modern era, because strategy is now fundamentally different, it's just fundamentally more complex, that bridge has been broken. That link between tactics and strategy has just been shattered. Uh, now we're looking at a fundamentally different mission set as you move from tactics to strategy, and you're looking at new principles and new problems. Uh, and basically, success at that tactical level is no longer predicting success at that strategic level because that bridge has been broken. But we're still expecting officers to go from one to another as if that bridge exists, and if it, as if success in one will lead to success in another, but that, that's just fallacious. You can't do that anymore. Now, of course, we're in the military, so the question that everyone is probably asking is what training, what experience, what do you recommend, right? We come out with a new FM, we change something up, we put our general officers through a new course, maybe create a new college uh, for people to go through, and I would say absolutely not. This is not a function of training or experience. And why do I say that? Because we've tried it. This has been the last 20 years. We have tried coming up with new ways to train strategic leaders, and it has failed resoundingly in all of those ways that you saw on my first slide. So why is that? I propose something new. I propose that this is a talent management problem. We're looking at a different kind of problem that needs a different kind of solution. So what exactly, what exactly am I talking about? Well, if you look at organizational literature, if you look at psychological literature, if you look at literature on human performance, what you tend to find is that people have enduring constellations of traits that are continuous across their entire life, or more or less continuous. These are very static concepts that each individual displays. Um, and specifically, and this is based off of research and observation, you have two types of people when it comes to kind of like solving problems and how people think about problems. And I've labeled these people cognitively adaptable and cognitively conservative. And these are fundamentally different types of people that exist in nature. So let's start on the left with cognitively adaptable. These are individuals who are big picture, risk tolerant, they tolerate complexity, they're quick learners and they're systematic. They have all of these traits, they're enduring, and they're very easy to spot. I, I mean, I think if you think about your just general surroundings, the people you work with, I think you'll recognize a few of these people. On the right, with cognitively conservative individuals, you have individuals who have a local focus, who are risk mitigating, very detail oriented, a word that the Army loves to use, uh, learn through experience, and they focus on their immediate environment. Now, if you'll notice, these different descriptions of these people line up pretty nicely with different types of tasks on both the tactical and strategic level. Specifically, cognitively adaptable traits line up with the tasks that are required of strategic leaders in the modern day, and cognitively conservative traits line up with those uh, requirements of tactical leaders. And in the past, the Army has mostly relied on these cognitively conservative individuals. And why is that? Well, because cognitively conservative individuals embody everything that the Army is looking for in a tactical leader. They are the epitome of a tactical leader. And because that link between tactics and strategy used to exist, we could just put these people through the pipeline, they'd get to the top, and they'd do fine, because tactics and strategy weren't that different. So we never really moved them out of their wheelhouse. But in the modern era, we're stretching these people. We're stretching them with this new form of strategy, and we're stretching them too far, and they're breaking. So just to kind of illustrate this point, if you look at our current per, uh, career progression, you're moving basically from the company level and then you're moving up to general officer where you're influencing strategy, you know, where you're working on those very big picture ideas. So if you have these two different types of people 
and they both join the army as officers. What you're gonna end up finding is that cognitively conservative people are gonna succeed on that tactical level because they are naturally tactical. They're naturally inclined to tactical tasks. And they're gonna easily move up the ranks to general officer. But once they get to general officer, they're very much outside their wheelhouse. So they are going to begin to fail in very noticeable ways. These cognitively adaptable people, now they may not fail at the tactical level, but what you're gonna generally see is they're gonna find that it's outside of their natural abilities and they're either going to find a way to get out of the army because they're not experiencing resounding success or they're gonna go into things like functional areas. So these individuals are basically being weeded out of the progression to general officer very early on in their careers. So they're never able to get to a point where they are working on the things that they're naturally good at. They're never able to influence strategy. So what are the solutions? Because we need these naturally inclined strategic leaders at the strategic level. We need them to solve the complex problems of today, but our current career progression, it's not set up for that. Well, I recommend something that I like to call the split track model. So essentially what this does is it allows, it's a talent management device that allows individuals to work on what they're good at in each and every part of their career. From the beginning to the end, they're working on things that they are naturally inclined to. Um, so as you can see, cognitively conservative people, what I basically did was I modeled their career path on what used to work in World War I and World War II, and I did so artificially. So they're just moving from the tactical level into larger and larger units, leading larger and larger units with larger and larger um, tasks, basically. But it's very similar to what they were originally doing in World War II before we saw this change in strategy. Whereas cognitively adaptable people, now at the company level, we're putting them in strategic positions, we're allowing them to work on strategy because we've divested the concept of general officer from the concept of strategy, excuse me, strategy. We've said, why? Why does there need to be that link? There shouldn't be. The people who are good at it should be working on it. Um, and their career uh, path, basically, they just move from working on strategy to working on more and more complex strategy where they can make more and more of a difference. We maintain the rank structure, but we kind of break it up and we separate some ideas from each other. Um, and as you can see, basically what these, this does is you allow people who have both of these skill sets to get to the highest levels and succeed uh, and make a difference in the Army. And of course, because it's the Army, they need to have the ability to move, to learn new things, to experience other, uh, the other career path in a sense, but the goal behind it is managing talent and making sure they're working on what they're good at consistently throughout their career timeline. Now what about West Point? Because everyone here is thinking, great, you know, big Army, good, makes sense, I'm not a general, I can't do this right now. What about West Point? Well, my proposition is that these cognitively adaptable people right here, they're not even making it through a session sources. They're not even getting into the big army as officers yet. Because what happens is these cognitively conservative people, they're looking at a session sources which are very much modeled on producing tactical combat leaders, and they're saying, hey, I'm great at this. This is awesome, this is super fun. And they make it out to the real army no problem where they go on to succeed at, tacti at the tactical level, the operational level, and then they move on to the strategic level, zero issues, and there, at the strategic le level, they begin to fail resoundingly. Um, then you have these cognitively adaptable people who are like, I am not good at this. Why don't I just go do something else? They go on to work for the NSA, for the State Department, and we immediately lose that talent. It is not even in our talent pool. We do not have access to that talent because our accession sources are weeding them out with those three words, tactical combat leaders. So to sum up, to very quickly sum up, tactical leadership success in the modern era does not necessarily mean strategic leadership success. There's no longer that bridge. One does not imply the other, and that's a change. That's a change that we've seen in the modern era. And yet we're continuing to act like that bridge exists. We are failing to adapt and to innovate in a changing battlefield, and in doing so, we are failing future generations. We are giving future generations an army that cannot adapt to the problems that they will experience and that are, is not gonna be able to win the nation's wars. And that's a huge issue because we need an army that can improve the nation's national and international security. That's our only mission. If we're failing to do that, we're failing everything and we're currently failing to do that. Again, that's our only mission. It's not tradition, it's not preserving the past. We need to adapt because the harsh reality of the modern battlefield is and especially in the Army, we innovate, we become better, we become stronger, or we die, quite literally in many senses. 
So thank you. Um, I'm sorry to end on that note, but I feel like it's necessary. Uh, so thank you all for coming today. And can we get a big hand just real quickly for Rio, who organized all this? He's just been absolutely amazing to work with, and I appreciate it. It's been wonderful talking to you all.